For many of us, the concept of health is defined as absence of disease. But do you really believe that to be true? As a specialist surgeon and teacher, I have come to the firm belief that true health is a balanced state between the mind, the body and the soul. Under the Knife with Dr. Arun is an attempt to tap into the wisdom of world experts from various fields to learn practical tools that can allow us to change our own destiny. Not just in the field of health and wellness, rather in every facet of a fulfilled life. But it begins with health. Because as Emerson said, health is our first wealth, the value of which is only recognized when it is lost. Join me in welcoming another global expert in this episode as we explore some amazing self-empowering ideas today. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Under the Knife with Dr. Arun, where we dissect world challenges that prevent us from leading empowered lives. My guest today is a very special person. She's a medical doctor. She's a pain specialist, but she has a very resounding message that I'm sure is going to resonate with every one of you. My guest today is Dr. Olivia Onk. Dr. Olivia has had a very special, I call it very special in the sense that she's had a journey of awakening because she experienced a significant event in her life in 2008. And as they say, you know, for us to wake up, we need a wake up call. And I'm going to be talking to Dr. Olivia about this in this special interview and how that has changed the trajectory of the work that she's doing and empowering and touching so many lives, especially of doctors, but not limited to doctors alone. She's empowering women through her TED Talks, through her books and through many other facets of the work that she's doing. So welcome, Dr. Olivia. It's a delight to have you on the podcast. Yes. Thanks for having me, Dr. Arun. Lovely. So let me just begin by asking you, Olivia, The tell me a little bit about the journey of your awakening. What happened in 2008? Sure. Uh, and how did that shift things for you? Yeah. So I guess, you know, to start off with that um, story, I'd like to share about how I was like before the spiritual awakening. Yes. Because um, I'm Asian. It's quite obvious. So, you know, raised in a typical Asian household, to be more specific, Singapore, in fact. So I grew up in an environment where being a high achiever was just a baseline assumption of everyone. I was taught that good enough was never good enough, which, which is quite common in an Asian you know, household. And then this continued at you know, a prestigious all-girls academy where I went to school and I was surrounded by perfectionists and high achievers and I was totally fine with that. So if you are a high achiever, you probably will understand that's pretty normal and you get that why I feel comfortable being in that environment, being a high achiever myself. But you don't, you, and you don't have to be an Asian to relate. You don't have to be, you know, I'm sure it's, it's I can relate to that. Uh, you know, you know what I mean? You know like I mean? coming from an Indian origin family, yes. there were only three options for me to be a doctor, engineer, or a failure. <laughs> that's, oh, that's it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> similar in Singapore. So it's a bit like that. But yeah. And you, you totally can understand, Dr. Arun, how that kind of environment can push like a high achiever like me just to push myself even harder, you know, along the yeah. way. And I did the same in medical school and in residency. And looking back, I can see I was hated towards burnout. But this was in 2006, when no one talks about burnout. No one actually knows what burnout is at that time. No. And, you know, like, um, and I have to say that at that point in time, it wasn't something that I was able to see at that time because I obviously had no knowledge what burnout was. Mm. And much less even say out loud that, hey, 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 I was in burnout. So I couldn't say all that. So when, when work gets busy, that when work gets really busy, what I do is I just do like, I just, I get busy with all the work, really. I just remember that I never stopped. I was just like a, you know, roadrunner. I, I think mm -hmm. of this cartoon character called Roadrunner just kept going and going. Um, And I just remember going from ward to ward, from patient to patient. I was, you know, doing my, I guess, rewrite, doing all the ward work, doing drug charts. I don't know. In my time, we had to rewrite drug charts. Now, I guess people don't. 
<laughs> in my time, I had to do that. And just felt like I was never fast enough. I just felt like no matter how fast I go, I was still never catching up with myself, really. Yes. And I remember just wishing that I had a catheter. And I'm sure that some of us have wished <laughs> that we had a catheter, <laughs> that we could keep continue with a ward round, right? Just kept <laughs> going, going, going. And I was yeah. thinking, oh, if I wished I had a catheter, that meant that I have to slow down, right? But I didn't obviously think like that. Just for the audience, Olivia, yeah. catheter is to relieve the bladder pressure. Just That's in it. case, because we are two doctors talking, I want to simplify it for others. That's it. That's it. And Thank I'm pretty you. sure some of us have thought about putting, like, intro, like putting um, caffeine uh -huh. coffee into our veins and just like, you know, uh -huh. going with that. I'm sure some of us have thought about that. Yeah. And, mm. you know, and, you know, slowing down is probably the last thing I had, I will think at that time because. Yeah. And, and and I just want to talk about this Lone Ranger concept that mm. not, not so much concept, maybe more programming since we we were in med school, we've been programmed like a Lone Ranger, perhaps. Asking for help would have been like admitting that we were not capable and they are saying not competent or we are, in, you know, stupid or whatever. Mm. So we don't ask for help. And, you know, like the medic, definitely the medical system was to blame for this kind of programming. Mm. And I'm sure, and I did what so many of us do, whether we're in medicine or whether we're in another high pressure, high stakes environment or profession rather. And every th little thing that we do, we start blaming ourselves. And I think some of, you know, some of the people out there who are listening to this can relate to that, how you start blaming yourself for the little things. It's something that a lot of people actually feel. And what I've come to realize that when we face adversity, we tend to criticize ourselves. And that self-criticism just leads us to the spiral of negativity. Mm. Yeah. And that was my life up until that day that you mentioned in September 2008. <laughs> to me, it was a day like any other or should have been, really. Like, it was just any ordinary day. I just turned up for work, which I had to. <laughs> like, mm. And then I remember that day, 10th of September 2008. I remember a car, an old beat-up Toyota, just reversing out of the... Ironically, the disabled parking spot, which I will end up using that spot for, for now, for, for some time now, 15 years now. Right. But when you look back, it's like, oh, I didn't expect to be using that spot, the disabled parking spot. And that's what happened. Yeah. Um, I didn't think of much of it because I said, hey, you know, cars come out and in and park car parks. And I just yes. walked along. And yeah, and unfortunately, that car ran me over. Oh, so they were coming in reverse and they ran you over. Yeah. It turns out that the driver of that car pressed the wrong gear. He was a 92-year-old gentleman with severe dementia. Oh. He right. shouldn't be driving. Yeah. And he yeah. must have pressed like the reverse, ge reverse gear or something. Instead of going forward, he went backwards and hit me. Wow. Yeah. And I remember being thrown up in the air. Because it, it was a, it happened very quickly in a blur. It was all a blur. But I remember being thrown up in the air and then just landing on the ground really hard. And like, it was a split second. Then when I opened my eyes, I felt an excruciating pain in my lower back. Wow. Yeah. And then it felt like time stood still, really. And I started putting together what happened. Mm. And, you know, first off, I um just, you know, I, I did, uh, I guess, a head to toe check. Hey, you know, first off, I was still alive. I knew that much. That was good news, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, you know, being alive. And then the doctor part of my brain kicked in, and there was more good news because I started going, I was able to think and started triaging myself, you know, as we do as doctors. Correct. And that was even more good news. I was like, hey, that's great. And then I started moving my arms, you know, because I was in my first year as a rehab registrar at that time, and I had all this knowledge about spinal cord injury and yes. rehabilitation. And I started moving my arms going, hey, I'm not quadriplegic. That, but when it came to my legs, what really s scared me was that I couldn't move or feel them. Wow. It was as if I was decapitated in half, like my, to to uh, my mm. torso onwards was there, but my legs were not there. Wow. Yeah. But I checked my legs were there. They're just in a very abnormal position and I yeah. got really scared. And deep down, I knew that, hey, this is a spinal cord injury. Probably paraplegia. Wow. Yeah, and 
And I also, with that knowledge about spinal cord injury, I realized that that was spinal shock, where, you know, when you had a spinal cord injury, you have loss of sensation, mm. weakness of the legs, and then loss of spinal reflexes. Just the initial shock. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I remember, you know, being transported to an, to the the major trauma hospital in, in Melbourne. Mm. very quickly because everyone clearly saw that it was like you know, a serious event mm. and I found myself abruptly on the other side of the healthcare system as a patient this time around yeah and I remember that those first few days not first few days probably even longer than that perhaps first few months in the hospital mm. were the most challenging of my life and wow I remember I had drips on my arms had a feeding tube up my nose or nasogastric tube yes and funny enough, I had that catheter that I had wished for a, a few months earlier. Like, oh, oh my God. God. I actually had a catheter this time around. I went, great. <laughs> That's the whole thing became really funny and ironical sometimes. You know, life can be Mind. can be like that. Yeah, yeah. It kind of manifested itself, right? Yeah. I mean, not, not that you wanted it, but in some ways, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that must have been like in a split second, the whole trajectory has changed. Must have been a big shock, Olivia. As you yeah. said, spinal shocks, shock to your 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 whole sort of, you would have planned things for yourself. This is what I'm going to do. So tell me what happened after that. I know you went to US and you did a lot of rehab work over there. So were you a practicing rehab and pain physician at that time? Were no, you at that, yeah, at that point in time, I haven't started, I haven't even finished my rehab training. So I was like first year out as a rehab registrar. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, JMO. And this, yes. Yeah. And this happened. Right. Mm -hmm. So exactly. what happened then after that, like must have been months and months of rehab and what made you go to US? Mm -hmm. Well, for a year or so, I ignored my intuition. And I talk about this a lot, like how as doctors, we tend to ignore our gut instinct or intuition. And I remember clearly um, a few months after my injury, because it, you know I was in the rehab ward where I was surrounded by people who are very depressed and sad, mm. and I, I, including myself. I didn't want to be in a wheelchair. I didn't want to lose my legs. Mm. I watched my friends move on with their life. They had kids. They became a consultant or you know, that kind of thing. And I just stay paralyzed in my wheelchair and I watched all that. But I remember a conversation I had with one of the patients in the rehab ward a few months after my injury. Um, he, they were talking about this spinal cord injury recovery center in San Diego called Project Walk. And of course, I went, you know, me being a scientific doctor and I'm going, mm -hmm. I don't believe in that stuff. That's not going to help me. In, even though my intuition was saying, do that, just, just, pack your bags and just go. Mm. I didn't listen to it. It was only until like almost 18 months after the injury um, that I actually, the intuition, like, you know, you know, intuition is funny. It usually nudges you and then it throws a rock at you after that. Like after some time, it will throw a rock at you or give you some dreams or something. Yeah. And then it kind of did that. It threw a big rock at, at, at me and going, hey, you got to go now. Like, you know, and this is 18 months after your injury. Yeah. For the 18 months, I try to prove to people. Yeah. yeah. Were you not improving in those 18 months? Is that very possible? slow? Um, in very Australia, slow. we don't have the technology that America has, unfortunately, yes. at that point in time. Even though, but now they do. Um, yes. This is like 2023, and that was yes. 20, 2008. Yes. But at that time, they didn't have the technology, and none of the therapists I worked with was very open minded. They just taught me to live life in the wheelchair, but I refused mm -hmm. to accept that. Yeah, because I just wanted to walk again. That was my. I was obsessed about it. Mm. I just wanted to walk again, and not only that, I was also very obsessed about returning to work to prove myself that I could still be a rehab. You registrar. could still be a consultant. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. and I did that. I, yeah. I did the work bit, but the, par the paralysis still remained. Yeah. So that I knew that there was a big life goal I had was to achieve it, and America was my only way out, and that's mm -hmm. why I did pack the bags. Wow. In 2010, I packed my bags with the husband, of course. And then we all, two of us relocated to San Diego for three years. Three long wow. years. Yeah. Must have been expensive as well. Like besides the, you know, the the whole shifting of 
you know, your your location, where you're living, where you're working. Plus, so tell me a little bit about, there are some really golden sort of nuggets that you have put in over there, Olivia. Mm -hmm. One is you talked about your intuition. So tell us, take us fast forward a little bit. What do you see? What was your biggest learning that allowed you to change your life trajectory from that incident? Absolutely. Based on what I've, I can see now looking back, my life before the injury, I wasn't, I want to talk about self-compassion for beginning. Yes. For, for a start, because before that, you could tell I wish I had a catheter. I didn't want to ask for help. Mm. I wasn't being self-compassionate to myself, mm. to be honest. Mm. But what the, this injury actually taught me was to be compassionate towards myself. Wow. And how I came to that realization was quite interesting. Because I remember that there was this epiphany moment there's always that epiphany moment one day that absolutely and you remember intuition. that you absolutely yeah, remember, remember it yeah it's probably intuition uh, uh, you know and all that mm. but i remember i was training with my trainer mika um on that day this is a year after i've been in san diego so this mm -hmm. is 2011 so i remember like at that point in time i could kind of stand on my own but she needed to hold me to make sure that i don't like you know mm. fall down and everything mm. but that particular day i remember she just like let go of me and say hey take some few steps by yourself wow and i, I freaked out because i never obviously I haven't done that for three like maybe about yeah. three years by by then it was three yeah. years since my accident i freaked out but i took i finally overcame that fear and took my first few painfully slow steps and I was like, wow, I did it. And mm -hmm. I remember saying to myself, the doctor is back in the house. I'm really excited. I was really excited. And this is like people cheering in the gym and all that. Wow. And I, and this is the, the epiphany moment because I was thinking, hey, wh where did that voice come from? I've never talked to myself like that. Like the mm -hmm. doctor's back in the house. In fact, it was like, come on, work horse. Get, you know, get your work done quick. Your boss is going to yeah. be unhappy if you're slow, blah, blah, blah. I actually congratulated and appreciated my myself. I'm like, wow, this is a different voice. I've never heard this voice before. Yeah. Yeah. And that voice was me just acknowledging that I was my own best friend, mm -hmm. but through that voice. Mm -hmm. Because for me, it, that voice has inspired and motivated me to get, you know, every day wake up for the therapy sessions to, you know, it's five hours every day. Wow. For Monday to Friday for three years. It's like a boot camp. And I'm yes. Like, oh, I was going to say, you're like training for the Olympics, right? A <laughs> bit like the Olympics of my life. I just wanted to walk again. And yeah, was, absolutely. Essentially, absolutely. it was that. It was that. Every day was like that. Some days I don't even feel like going to, to yeah. the therapy. How did, I, I was going to ask you, how did you cope with despair? You know, did you, ha did you lose hope sometimes, uh, Olivia, in these situations? Totally. I lost hope many times, but what I did is instead of being like isolating myself, being a lone ranger and all that, I yeah. actually asked for help. I actually connected with other spinal cord injury survivors in the gym. And because we oh, all yeah. are very small, we all live in San Diego. There, there are some Aussies, some New Zealanders, some right, mostly Americans, of course, but yes. we all form a little community where we hang out together. We became good friends. Wow. We know how we get each other because we all have spinal cord injury, you know, mm. um, and all that and throughout that journey three years that i became kinder to myself so every little win i had mm. even though i just like let's say i walked a few more steps or something yeah i congratulated myself i learned finally learned what mindfulness is it's just mm. being because learning to walk again is the best mindfulness exercise oh well. you but have to Focus had, all your efforts and energy on that. Yes, yeah. and I learned that instead of being autopilot, I just had to be mindful every one step time. at a time. All right. So, so a lot of life lessons I learned from this injury in America. Yeah, yeah. Which is self compassion. And, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's what brings me to this topic. You use the word adversity, and mm -hmm. I think statistics tell us that every adult, on an average, is likely to experience two to three major adverse events in their lives. Yeah. And about six to seven minor adverse events in their life. And I think what I see is Olivia, and should allow me to sort of, you know, I would like to get your opinion as well about it. Mm -hmm. But I get an impression that, you know, 
we are making the next generation very soft. This is my impression. I may be biased. As a surgeon, when I was training, there was no concept of safe working hours. And I'm not suggesting that that is the best way, but I remember once very clearly when I was in the UK and we were doing an esophagectomy and it was 2001 or thereabouts. And I remember esophagectomy is a big operation where you are removing the food pipe because of the cancer there. And I remember this young doctor who had just gotten into the training program. The professor was operating. I was the first assistant. And this uh, junior doctor, he within four hours of the surgery, he said, Professor, it's my time to leave. I'm not being paid for staying on for this operation. Now, that sort of a thing I'd never heard of. He removed his gloves and gown and he left, you know. Now, that was the end of his surgical career. I get that. But the important thing is, I see this so consistently that we are having a generation that is very, very sensitive. So this is my impression. I see that sometimes with my kids. I know this is the parent and me talking sometimes. But I want to ask you that do you feel that being over soft or over caring creates a generation that is over needy as well. And they, they are more liable to respond in extreme ways to adverse events in our lives. It, it takes away that ability to resilience. I'd like to get your thoughts about it. Yeah, I'm actually seeing a different perspective on this young doctor that decided to, you know, say, set a boundary saying this is up, my time is up with the surgical assisting and I'm going now. Mm. I think he's actually a, he's, a, he's a he, right? He's a he, he, um, he's applying what I call fear self-compassion because he value his time and energy so much that he's just decided, okay, I'm going to value it. I'm just going to leave now. So I, I see it from that perspective. Mm. But I also see a generation that's happening with our younger generation, unfortunately, with social media, with the, you know, with instant gratification because they get things right. done quick. And everything's like, you can buy stuff from Amazon with a click of a button, right? Or something. Even instant Uber Eats, the food is in front of you in an hour. Exactly. So that's that right. too. But because it's, it's a double-edged sword, it's bad because it's making them like, getting this instant gratification dopamine hit going yay Correct. I want this now but also they have access to media now we have chat GPT and all these things yeah they have access to like all this information about the even like soft skills and other things and I'm seeing a different generation of people yes you know they, they want things done now they're getting a bit like grumpy because they want things now. I think that's why they're yeah. they appear to be soft because they're like, come on, man, like I, I, it can be done now. Why are you taking so long? Yeah. But at the same time, they have access to all this, all these online resources about how to tap into their, I guess, soft skills or emotional intelligence and all this like mindfulness. It was and self compassion was in two thousand and one and three. It was like nobody knew what it was. Now it's no. like. Not only that, they have the app for it. They can access yeah. meditation app. They can do online learning for online learning, online meditation class, and and all these things. You know, and sure, yes. very different. I'm seeing different generation. Um, Absolutely. So Olivia, I I want to just delve a little bit into you mentioned the word. You know, your gut feeling, your intuition. I I can and I can sense that one of your own discoveries or self-discovery was to be able to learn to listen to that intuition. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. We call the small voice within. We try and suppress it down. We say, no, no, I'm not right. I have to listen to other people to seek validation. Mm -hmm. How do you develop that? If somebody was wanting to learn from you, you know, to say, uh, Dr. Olivia, please tell me what are the nuggets or what are the lessons that we can use to start developing, to learn to that inner voice. Yeah. I just want to think about how I started tapping more and more into my intuition. I felt that for me, meditation practices were the, the starting point for me. Because that's wow. you're actually taking the time to pause and reflect and listen. And that's usually your intuition telling, like, you know, guiding you or... So did you have to learn the meditation from someone while you were in San Diego or uh, was it something that you were on the journey anyways? Yeah, I was on the journey anyway. And I, I know that you had Craig Hassard on your on your on one of your guests in your podcast. And he was actually the first 
re- the reason why I started mindfulness oh, in 2016. Yeah. Because he um he gave a lecture to us rehab phys- like doctors um in our conference and I found it fascinating. So I obviously I um looked into the research bit because obviously as being a doctor you wanted the scientific bit. The left yeah. brain was like, come on man, give me some research. Yeah. I think he had some online courses through Monash University. Well, it was free and I started that. And I went, wow, this is very very powerful. Mm. So that was it. All started like that and. And then subsequently, I started, you know, doing a little bit of meditation. I wouldn't say I was a full on meditator. I did it when I had the time. Yeah. So I wasn't like very, like consistent. Yeah. I only became a consistent meditator, I guess, during the pandemic. Interestingly, because we I had all this spare time. I didn't have yeah. to travel to work. Did everything for for my work as a pain specialist on telehealth and I just had all this I didn't have to travel to work so yeah. I had all this spare hour or two along the day and I'm like hey, let's focus on meditation personal development and all that yeah yeah, yeah I think you, that you, you, you did not meditate prior to the injury only no. after that you started that's doing... correct yeah got yeah. it got it all right so where does the role of you know you were talking about intuition and mm-hmm. you were listening to your intuition when you made the decision to go to San Diego so where was that voice how would you suggest to you know again we're talking about some practical suggestions so you said one is meditation that will allow you to start listening to that voice within what what happens then uh, olivia whether are uh, we like we may be just listening to thoughts in our head how yeah. do you know that whether this is really the right thing to do how do you uh, you know as they say separate the shaft from the grain yeah um I guess for a couple of years now, I've been kind of doing a lot of work that Mind Valley is doing. I don't know whether you've heard of. I'm yes, sure a lot, lot of people heard. There are some. I think there are organizations that try to integrate spirituality and science together. Yeah. And I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, um, they you know they kept emphasizing on this morning routine thing because, like, for some time I've I've kind of ignored the morning routine because I felt like I didn't have time for all this. Like you mm. know. But then pandemic happened. You had the, you had time, so there's no excuses yeah. there for for my yeah. for me. Yeah. So I started doing um some meditation, like a morning routine, at yeah. almost at, like I started a few times a week because I don't think I can do it every day at that point. Mm. In time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Started with meditating first, and then I I do what I call journaling. Journaling is actually a form of intuitive download because you Correct. start writing, and guiding by your you know your intuition is guiding your writing. Correct. So that's how I kind of tap into it. And then I finish up usually with some kind of learning, like watching a TED talk, which is quite funny that I've now done one because yeah. I started watching quite a lot of them every day, like one talk, because that's like 18, 18 to yeah. 20 minutes and, and all that. So now, so I had my morning routine. I still do my morning routine. I'm very consistent now. And that's really helped Yeah, with just calming the, you know, calming and the to mind. to be able to connect with that voice. Correct. That, that, yeah. hey, the doctor is back in the house voice, you know. The one yeah. One. Yeah. Way back then. Yeah. But that's good. And I often give the analogy of, you know, what meditation, when I, I'm talking to people, yes. I often give the analogy that, you know, you imagine a glass of water which has got mud in it. And if you just stir it up, the whole water is muddy. But if you just let it sit for a little while, all the mud will settle down mm-hmm. and the water becomes clear again. And that's precisely what. Uh, meditation does for you it allows you to become clear in your thinking so that you know what is relevant and what is not relevant you know Uh, i mean of course it is a practice it's a muscle that you have to build uh, as we sort of you know progress on and on Mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit about olivia what are you doing how's your day looking like these days i know you're working with many organizations now uh, you gave recently a talk to empowered, I think, entrepreneur women or bu- uh, women in business. So tell me a little bit about where is this taking you in your life journey? And yeah. how are you looking at empowering other people? Absolutely, uh, Dr. Aaron. So at the moment, I still work four days as a pain physician. Right. But I also have a um, education and coaching company called the Heart Centered Method Institute. Right. Where it's a, I, um, I created this company because, you know, I was just seeing rampant burnout in doctors mm. over the last couple of years. Um, it's actually doubled from forty percent to almost seventy percent. Wow. So it's almost doubled. Wow. Um, post pandemic, 
And so, fact, can I ask you the reason for that, Olivia, while we're just discussing that? Yeah, absolutely. In Obviously, your view? The yeah, the pandemic is a big cause because we right. had to make lots of decisions, decision fatigue. Yes. Like whether this person gets the ICU bed and we yes. have to make decisions like that. Correct. And I think what also happens after such a, like a you know big pandemic event is the collective mm. trauma we all felt yes ex and experienced but we never actually talked about it at all like no one talks about it um and that's contributing to the burnout and yeah. and i think that's why burnout's kind of being talked about now because we're seeing a high suicide rates in doctors too that's why everyone's getting a bit like oh, we did, we need yeah we kind of need to talk about it and do something about it yeah. In fact, I was listening to one of the psychiatrists from the US and he was saying in this particular pandemic, there was something unique. Everybody was wearing a mask. So, you know, you lose that facial expression, those mm -hmm. emotional connections that you have from a facial expression by seeing you could not go and meet your friends. You could not go and see your family members. And even those people who you were connecting with, you were wearing a mask. So that played that has an impact on, you know, our psychology of connection. Exactly. And you're right, Doctor. When you mentioned about connection, that's what we lacked. Uh, yeah. A lot of us started working virtually from home. And it's not the same as face-to-face mm. -face, like, interaction, right? It's, it's not the same. Correct. Um, you know, it, virtually, we can do the best we can. We play bingo. I think my team played bingo. You know? <laughs> and all this, we tried our best to have yeah. virtual coffees. But it's not the same as no, it's never the same. Out in, in at work or after work. In, you know, Correct. Dinner or something. That's very different. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, tell us where is this taking you? Tell us a little absolutely. bit. Absolutely. So yeah, because of what I what really breaks my heart is seeing the burnout rates mm. and doctors committing you know committing suicide because they have they see no way out. That's why I created the company. Yes. Which is to help doctors become more heart centered. And I want to talk a bit about what heart centered means. Yeah. Because I get well, asked this a lot. Like, what does heart centered correct. mean? Am I a care bear or what? No. Well, it's sort of like a care bear, but it's. And you mentioned John DiMartini um, earlier on. Yes. And I believe in his values exercise. And mm. I do this with, with a lot of my coaching clients, the values track. Yes. Where I, it's a, it's a gap analysis. I get to see whether my clients are on track or off track. And then it's quite, yes. quite clear cut whether they are or not. Mm. Um, if they're not living according to their values track or feeling, or if they're not living in a life that's in alignment with their values, mm. Chronic stress happens, anxiety happens, depression happens. Correct. Trauma happens and burnout eventually happens. So I think the value strike is a good way to get getting them realigned. Um, yeah. And that's the work I do in my coaching space. But I also speak about burnout and you know, and how to we can prevent and manage burnout in hospitals and clinics. That's why I do these days in my speaking. Yeah. Uh, opportunities. Uh, and I think in the real simplest way, burnout is nothing but stress that has become out of control. Exactly. Really, you just not. And I often say this to my patients, clients, audience, that it's not that you are planning to live a stress free life completely. Stress is good for you, mm -hmm. but you need to learn how to manage that stress. If Absolutely. you don't know how to manage the stress, it's going to you're going to lead. It's going to lead to burnout. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. sorry, yeah, I, I just wanted to add that in because that's such a big realization uh, that people are thinking of leading completely stress-free lives, which doesn't exist, sadly. Mm. And, you know, with, I guess, in the healthcare industry, burnout is inevitable. That's yeah. the thing. It is inevitable. We can't change the healthcare system. We can't change the environment. Uh, we can't change the economy. And it comes with caregiving. As a part of caregiving, you do take on the stress, you know, regardless of whether we've been taught that, you know, you don't need to be emotionally connected with your kid, with your patients. You do develop a rapport with them. Yeah, we're all humans. We all we're all humans, want, exactly. We want to connect, we want to help, you know. Exactly. We're all like that. And that's part of being human. Yeah. And that's okay being human. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, Olivia, where wh what does the future hold for you? Wh wh where are you? What's the vision? Share with us a little bit. We are very curious to know. Yeah, absolutely. So you've set up the company. You've set up your coaching business as well. You're taking on clients. And I will get you to just share with us where people can find you at the end of the interview. But what is the vision? 
Yeah, for the next couple of years, you know, um, one of the big values that I have, my values track, yes. was is actually to do stuff with my family, like right. things with my family, projects with my family. And I had the opportunity to write a children's book with my son, Joseph, last year. Beautiful. called Jojo the Kind Sloth a uh, children's book about self developing self-compassion very nice yeah and um I want to build I want to do more legacy projects mm. with my family whether it's writing a book with my daughter who's I know she's only three but you know tiger parent oh. yeah. but anyway <laughs> anyway no, um doing projects with the family you know yeah. Like doing, yeah, and, and things like that that I can kind of you know um, um do together just being present with them travel a lot more Mm. and combine also like you know speaking opportunities can combine with travel travel was one of my values yeah my values track so i can combine speaking and traveling and all that so i want to do a bit more traveling now that we can all travel yeah and then combine it with some speaking opportunities about yeah. a topic i'm i'm passionate about which is burnout and doctors yeah absolutely it will make me a very happy person i also get to spend time with the family so that ticks absolutely. all the boxes and in the val values track yeah and I think you mentioned about Dr. Martini. one of the things I attended his breakthrough mm -hmm. experience and what I really loved was that defining or determining your values is so critical to know who the person you are. The reason for burnout, I also believe, is that when we don't know who we are, we're just working like a machine. That's and right. I understand there is I've worked in the public system and I understand the pressures of a public system, the waiting list, the KPIs and the targets and all of that. But I think if we don't know the meaning behind why we are doing what we are doing, it leads to, you know, like we're disconnected. Mm. There is our heart and soul is not in there what we are doing. And that leads to burnout, in my opinion, at least. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um... This is my time to kind of talk a little bit, a little bit about burnout. What yes. what are what is burnout? Yeah. So I I try to think of, you know how the Energizer Bunny just goes and when it runs out of battery, it just stops. Yeah. The thing with us in healthcare, doctors, nurses, paramedics. Correct. Even though that, for us, we I think it's better to think about it as energetic bank account. Yes. And. Be like think about the, a bank account if you overdraw what happens it becomes negative but we yeah. still have to show up for our patients right we can't yeah. go it's negative i'm gonna have a nap now we can't yeah. do that no so i just want to quickly touch upon the, the yes. three signs of burnout yes. number one is energy depletion which is which means your physical energetic bank account is almost empty or negative balance mm -hmm. so this is like just using the example of bank account yeah yeah yeah, and yeah everyone gets it can relate oh, to this Everybody like, oh, related this. <laughs> you're like, okay, we got it. And the second sign of burnout is compassion fatigue, which yes. we recognize in our colleagues. Yes. It, it manifests as venting, um, sarcasm, blaming the healthcare system, blaming yeah. lots of the blaming. You see that a lot in, in healthcare. That's an indication that your emotional bank account is almost it's empty low. or negative. And, and you are and, a victim. You're a victim of that. Yeah, a victim mindset. You're like, oh, this yeah. is like, this is everyone's fault except me kind of thing. Yeah. And you touched about, you touched on like loss of purpose. That's mm. actually the third sign of burnout, mm. which is loss of life purpose because you start questioning, what's the point of me being a doctor, nurse, yeah. social worker? What's the point? I should just quit my job and open a cafe. Not, nothing wrong with opening a cafe. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, that kind of, and that's your exactly. spiritual bank account. Oh, spiritual, spiritual bank account. Spiritual energetic bank account. Oh, spiritual energetic account. Jeez, yes. bank account. Spiritual energetic account going to empty or zero. Yeah. Or negative balance. Yeah. That's, very, that's the most devastating of the three. Oh, that's, you've summarized it beautifully. And I think, uh, you know, uh, these three, the purpose I feel is so important uh, because as we just discussed, you know, that gives you the meaning. Why do you get up in the morning? That's it. Go to work. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, that's that is so true. And thank you for putting it so beautifully, Olivia. I know we are running short of time and I want to ask you these three questions that mm -hmm. I ask all my guests, Olivia, who are on the on the podcast. And if I can ask you, the first one is what is your most single most successful habit that has allowed you to reach this point in your life where you're doing such amazing things, you know, 
really, I commend you for that, you know, like coming from a, uh, you know, sort of a high achieving background, having to go through this significant adversity, unexpectedly, totally, and still bouncing up. I'm, I don't call it bouncing back. I call it bouncing forward. You've bounced forward from all of this work. So uh, tell me, what is your single most habit? If somebody was listening to this and they said, just one thing, if I, if I can take from your routine, what would that be? It's the power of visualization. Because I remember those years when I had my injury, my legs were paralyzed. Yeah. And every day I spent visualizing how I walk, what I'll do when I walk again. Every day was like that. I mean, there were days where it was like challenging and I felt like giving up. Yeah. But I kept consistently like visualize what life will be like when I walk and I'll be doing these things. And yeah. that's that helps. And I still do the, the visualization process almost on a daily basis now. Just wow. imagine what I'll be in like six months, 12 yeah. months, that kind of thing. And yeah, it's, it's an amazing process. That's, so that's and it's so amazing to hear that from a analytical, left brain, high achieving person like you to say visual. People might think that, oh, this is like all woo woo and this is like black magic and those kind of things. But actually there is science behind it. Absolutely. Think about the athletes you see like Serena yes. Williams, Ash Bari, uh, you know, NBA players, they all do this visualization. Correct. They do, they do. So I don't know why we're any different, with, you know, just because we're on. Spot on. The no. white, wearing a white coat or whatever. Yeah. Is there a time when you do the visualization in the morning or in the evening or at night before you go to bed? Is there a time? Because I'm a morning person. So definitely the morning helps. Okay. I, yeah. Just, okay. I'm, I'm more alert and I can like channel the imaginative yeah, side of the that, brain. That's... That's yeah. beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, second question, uh, Olivia, if I were to give you a hypothetical scenario that all your books, all your TED talks and everything was taken away and you had to just give three pieces of wisdom to your kids. OK, what would you tell them? What, what was the what would be those three things or pieces of message or mm. truths, as I call it? Yeah. Because this is something I've thought about a lot. Because what will I say to the younger Olivia when she was a child? Mm. I will tell her that, you know, or and my kids as well, that yes. you are you are enough, or in fact, you are more than enough. So that's what I would like to, that's one thing I like to tell them. Yeah. So they don't have to go searching to find the enoughness in their life. Because yeah. they are... With external they, things. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. They don't have to buy fancy cars and whatever. And yes. They all have, they, they're enough from the inside. And the second thing I want to tell them is, you've got this. Like literally, it's just three words. You've got this. Um, that means that not only they they are enough, they have, they have it in them to do what they want. So you've got yeah. this. You've got this. Which is what Mika told that my trainer told me when I st started taking my first few steps. You've got this. You got this. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to with tell that them attitude my, with that attitude as well. Yeah, you've like, got you've this. Got this. Yeah. <laughs> got this. And lovely. Yeah, and the third thing I will the third thing I will say is be your own best friend. You are you are more than enough. You've got this. Be your own best friend. Three things oh. I want to tell my my children. Definitely. Oh, that's that's so beautiful, and that could be a message for anyone because I think at yes. the core of it, I see that it is self doubt that we are trying to overcome, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. It's, and you don't have doubt. to. Listen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now that's beautiful. You have put it really beautifully, Olivia. And the last question I have is, what do you see as your legacy? I know you've already touched upon it, that you want to spend more time with your family, you want to travel, you want to be more present and such a beautiful thing to write books with your kids. And like, I mean, that is such a beautiful thing to do as a parent, because when they grow up, they'll say, look at this book that I wrote when I was three years old with my mommy. So yeah. that would be awesome. You know, so what is your legacy sort of, is there any Anything more that you're thinking about your legacy, Olivia? Yeah, um, I guess a big part of us uh, who do the work we do, who are mission-driven people, are driven by leaving behind a legacy that people, even when we pass on, mm. the people after us will still like look at our message and say, hey, she did embody all that. She, yeah. led, she led that life. And I think my legacy that I want to pass on is just, you know, Again, being your own best friend is really my legacy. Yeah. As, I mean, there's a lot of great cartoons and movies out there about this theme, Toy Story with friends and all that. But still, being your own best friend is my legacy. I want to impart that, yeah. you know. You're living it right now. You're, yeah, you're, whatever you're doing. Exactly, yeah. because we know this intellectually, but 
our our brains are still like, oh, are you are you sure you're only your own best friend? Mm. Like you said, self doubt is still there, but yeah, just being your own best friend, you know, no. that's the legacy I want to leave behind. Oh, beautiful, Olivia! I want to commend you for the beautiful work you're doing amazing inspirational life that you're leading you don't know how inspirational it has been just to talk to you i'm sure that there are people who will listen to this who who see your work or who are touched by your story will reach out but can you tell just for the benefit of the audience where can they find your books and i'm sure they can google things but you know is there any other place that you would uh direct them to absolutely my website has everything like from by, where you can buy my books or how you can connect with me on social media is on my website, Beautiful. which is um, www.dralivialeong.com. Uh, so you can find me. You can even find me on Google. Apparently, my SEO is pretty good. And I'm yes, somewhere out there. You are really <laughs> right up there. I didn't have any trouble uh, finding you. <laughs> yeah, so um, you can, uh, you know, the audience can reach me on social media as well. I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn and I'm also on Instagram. So many ways they can reach out to me if they Beautiful. just want to know a bit more about my work. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And we'll put it in the show notes as well in terms of, you know, your website links. Thank you so much, Olivia, from a, from the bottom of my heart to a heart centered doctor. Uh, I wish you all the very best. Go ahead, touch lives, inspire people and spread your wings. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Dr. Thank you. Pleasure.